Hey, welcome to Build. Um, it is so great uh, to have you all here. Welcome to my home. And uh, over from his home is Jeff Ma. Jeff Ma is our just new to Microsoft, uh, not new to startups, but he is our general manager of Microsoft startups. And Jeff, tell me a little about yourself. Yeah, so um, I have been an entrepreneur probably for the better part of 25 years, um, have started four different companies. Uh, the last three have been in Silicon Valley, um, where I've uh, really been focused on a few different industries. Most recently, I started a company that was in the developer productivity area, where we were trying to use analytics from different places where developers spend their time already. So think GitHub, Pivotal Tracker, Jira, um, and take that uh, information um, and bring it into one central place where you're able to analyze it and use it to create uh, insights about your team and about individuals. And that company I was fortunate enough to sell to Twitter. Um, what was interesting is that Twitter had just starting, started an engineering effectiveness team and was really trying to understand the productivity and definitely like the just visibility and transparency around what um, their engineers were working on. And uh, went in there uh, and spent about three and a half years there and eventually was leading data science and analytics because obviously I have a background in that also. Um, really enjoyed the world of, of you know, working at a, a company with scale and a company with um, real resources as opposed to the startup world. I think I enjoyed it a lot more than I ever thought I would so that when this opportunity came around to join Microsoft and really help Microsoft become a, you know, a, a, a bigger um player and a, and a more influential um you know player in the startup space it was like a super interesting um opportunity for me um you know i worked at twitter for about a couple of years as well we missed each other for two months we actually met ourselves through the interview process when you come on board at microsoft you know for twitter it was a game-changing kind of opportunity for me to work there it was first getting into silicon valley working in san francisco um, frankly, the combination of like running something that is really, you know, kind of the town square uh, around the world of conversation combined with a platform that is just like at scale, um, it, it, it completely changed me as an engineer. It changed in how I do outward reach. Why don't you tell me just a little bit more about your time at Twitter and some of the things you learned that you think would be helpful for startups? Yeah, I mean, like the Twitter situation for me was tremendous in that um, when I first got there, I, I often talked about how working at Twitter remind like the skills that I had learned as an entrepreneur really transferred in my work at Twitter, because essentially what I was doing was being an entrepreneur within an organization. So I was like really um an entrepreneur within the Twitter universe. And as an entrepreneur, when you first start a company, your universe is pretty small, i.e. you're not actually out there talking probably to the Microsofts and whatever the world. You, you probably have a small universe of, of people that you're able to talk to and able to network with and able to, you know, companies, whatnot. And that size of your universe is very similar to the size that you may have of a Twitter. And, and in many cases, like for a Microsoft, my work at Microsoft, it's much smaller than my universe at Microsoft. My universe at Microsoft is much bigger. So there were many things around like getting to know people and networking. So at Twitter, obviously, just like any company, who you know is really important. And your ability to like sell your ideas and your thoughts to them is really important. Your ability to build influence and to recruit people, not necessarily just to join your team, but to recruit them into whatever motion or whatever you know thing you're trying to accomplish. So there's, I guess, another a sales component is what I would say. Like entrepreneurs never realize how much sales they do from the moment they start a company. It becomes all sales. And I think it was funny because as a as you know, there was a point in my life when I realized as an entrepreneur that one of the greatest skills that I had learned was sales. And I think I naturally like shied away from that as someone that came from a technical world to sort of marginalize my skills and say that they were developing like I had developed sales. And I don't mean marginalize like any salespeople that are listening to this. It's not a matter of saying that those are marginal skills. But as technical people, we we don't think about we think about building products and we think about 
the the guts behind a system and how how hard it is and the sales is sort of the icing on the cake but really the sales skills are so important in anything that you do and you know as i realized that um in my time at, at twitter i think it, it made me realize like how important those skills that i had learned as an entrepreneur were that's really great i mean uh for me at twitter it was about the people um i got to work with some incredible folks like Adam Bain, Dick Costolo, Janet Messerschmidt, um, Katie Stanton, they're just like all like many great work operators, but now many of them are angel investors and doing startups and advisors. And it was, I was so blessed by the people we had to work with. Um, it was a great time of my life. Um, you talk about it, always be closing, um, always be selling. There's a great movie about that. Um, but I'd say, you know, not about steak knives today, Tell me a little bit about the elephant in the room here, uh, or not the elephant, but this thing. Let's not bury the lead. Let's get it out of the way. You were in a movie. In fact, you're actually, a lot of it was like central characters based on you. Sure. Uh, Blackjack, 21. Am I? Yeah. Tell me more. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's definitely something that has been, you know, someone asked me actually relatively recently, like, does it bother you when people keep talking about the movie and the the stuff? And and honestly, like, it doesn't for the primary reason that it's afforded me so many opportunities and so many great networking. You know, it's like an ultimate icebreaker. It's the ultimate like thing that makes people interested in talking to me, almost disproportionately for like how you know valuable, important it is a thing that I did. So, and when I was at MIT, and really when I graduated from MIT. Um, for about seven years, from 1994 to 2001, I was a professional blackjack player, and it was always a side job. And I always actually said that one of the great things about doing the blackjack thing was that it allowed me and afforded me the opportunity to be an entrepreneur. And it afforded me the opportunity to do basically whatever I wanted with my other time, independent of making money. So that's sort of the dream of an entrepreneur. That's like the idea is like, hey, you don't have to worry about making money in the short term. You can just go worry about building a business or chasing a passion or chasing a dream. And that's what the blackjack stuff really did for me because it was just this great source of money that I could do on the weekends or a couple times a month. And we were professional card counters. We basically used math to beat the game of blackjack where Blackjack is a game that's subject to something called conditional probability, meaning what you see impacts what you're going to see. And so we were able to create a system that allowed us to you know, make money um, and, and significant money over the long term. Um, and it was like statistically, you know, uh, it, it was it was um, governed by like big data or governed by real analytics. And there wasn't it's funny because like there wasn't a ton of real gamble attached to it because we we're playing a, a plus expected value game and you know even much more quantifiable than playing the stock market is or doing options trading is which is something that else that i was doing in my time um and in 2001 i approached a friend of mine by the name of ben mesrick and i said hey this is a great idea i've got a great idea for your next book and um he had written six books at the time but it was fair to say that his career was um, not not doing particularly well. And he was contemplating going to business school, had business school applications out. And when I told him the story of what we did, he largely was uninterested and was sort of like, I don't think anyone wants to read a book about a bunch of MIT nerds. And then I took him with me to Vegas and he said, oh, my God, this is so cool. We should write a book about this. And I was like, oh, great idea. And then we turned to his publisher and pitched it to her. She was less than enthusiastic about it, but basically bought into it. And we wrote the book on a very limited, you know, like advance and limited run rate and all that kind of stuff. And then it, you know, got turned into a best selling book. It was spent over a year on the New York Times bestseller list. And then eventually it was turned into a movie that was number one in the box office um, two weeks in a row, made $150 million off a $35 million budget. Awesome return on investment. Great product fit. Um, you know, I've read the book, seen the movie a couple times. Um, is there anything that didn't make it into the book or, or movie that you're like, oh man, I wish we'd got that in? Is there any little things of um, 
for folks that have followed along and watched it that didn't make it in that you wish uh, wish had or some sort of insight, uh, something that you can share that didn't make it in? I guess I just wish people knew about how hard we worked and how like little real fun we had. And it was sort of like one of those, like my my main mentor is a guy by the name of Kevin Compton and Kevin was the operating partner at Kleiner Perkins during the heyday um, of that firm. And he has told me this analogy, which is what he calls the ice cream analogy. And when you're little, um, you can eat all the ice cream you want because you don't get fat, and but you can't drive to get it and you have no money to pay for it. And then you get a little bit older and you can still, you know, eat all the ice cream you want because you're a teenager and you finally have a driver's license so you can drive to go get it, but you still don't have any money because you don't have a job yet. And then when you get older, you now have a job so you can beat it. You can, you know, order all the ice cream you want and pay for it. You can drive to go get it, but you're going to get fat if you eat it. And so the, the analogy here is that I don't think when we're young, we realize like the opportunities that we have in life. And in that time when we were playing blackjack, we did not have very much fun at all. We did not leverage all of these amazing moments. Like the movie makes it out to seem like we were just having, there were moments certainly that were amazing. Like, you know, meeting professional athletes and, you know, having, you know, going, sitting at a table and betting 10 times what they're betting and having them, you know, almost feel like they need to suck up to you. That's obviously a fun moment, but we worked really hard. We didn't drink at all when we were playing. That was a real rule. And um, our our job to when we were there was to work. And people think like, oh, you need to be some brilliant person to card count, but that's actually not true. You you need to be like relatively proficient in you know math at some level. But the math is addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. It's not like any advanced math. And it's the ultimate lesson that you just need to practice. It's something that you have to practice and practice and practice. And if you do it well you know, you can make money over the long tail. So there's just a lot of basic discipline and business lessons that, you know, probably wouldn't make itself into a movie, but is so important in like the lesson that, you know, I would love to sort of teach my kids that came from playing blackjack. So even I can learn how to do card counting. That's, that's a relief. I always thought it was like, you know, I know you're smart, but if you can teach me to do card counting, that would kind of blow my mind. Maybe we'll do that one of these days. Uh, let's move to the office space because you're, um, you know, you're at Microsoft now. Um, and I'd say a couple things like, how did you end up, you know, what led you here? Or even like, what would you say it is that you actually do around this place? I know you just started, <laughs> but uh, what would you say you do around here? And kind I of think I do what everyone else does in this day and age. I sit behind a laptop all day and I have sweatpants on. And, you know, these uh, the jokes that people make right now on Twitter, you know, like I every morning I'm like, I, I, I miss pants, right? Like, I, I wonder when the last time I no, I um, let's see. I, I came into this role very opportunistically. Um, the guy by the name of Eric Boyd, who is a guy that you know I really cut my teeth with in the world of of startups and just generally the internet. Um, Eric um, was at a company with me called Interdimensions. It was a company that he had started with some of his friends um, from MIT, and they were just at this time it was like 1996. They were literally just building web systems websites for companies and they were just you know they were there were some financial institutions that were trying to get online there were it was it was very basic stuff and and eric had written actually a um a game called get rich click for a company called yoyadine that was started by a guy by the name of seth godin and for some of you og people out there you'll know his books um but that company ended up getting sold to yahoo and eric um you know with that went off to the world of Yahoo. Um, they basically recruited him away from interdimensions and he wanted to go to greener pastures to the Silicon Valley world. Fast forward to sort of 20 some years from then, Eric is a CVP at Microsoft running the you know ML and AI tools that um, that you know um, Microsoft has on Azure. And he reached out to me and said, hey, Jeff, one of my colleagues has uh, an, a job opportunity around startups that I think you might be interested in. And he actually didn't even know, like we had kind of lost touch a little bit. He didn't know that I'd left Twitter. And he was like, I don't even know if you're looking, but if this is a, 
interesting to you, you should reach out. And I had been doing some consulting work for the board and the CEO of AT&T around sort of media and sports. And it was really strategy work. It was super interesting. It was fun. But I didn't know if it was going to turn into a full-time role. And I, I wasn't sure that I stopped, wanted to stay in sports. And like I have always, because sports is a real passion for me, I've always kind of gone back and forth between technology and sports. And sports is like fun, but it's really small. And people think it's really big, but it's not. And technology is much bigger. The opportunity is much, you know, it's, it's just it's just huge. And so, um, you know, this role, you know, and I, I had spent about two years away from Twitter. So I had, you know, explored a variety of different opportunities, but I'd never really gotten close on any of them because as I got in them, I'm like, I don't really want that job or I can't see how I'd be happy in that job. And, you know, when, when Eric first approached me, obviously there was this natural, like, wait, Microsoft, but Microsoft had, you know, in Satya's reign over the last four years, it's just been this tremendous, you know, thing that from afar we've looked at in the Valley and been like, wow, the progress that they are making and just the way that they're changing the percent, like I was very open to that conversation where four years I probably had it wouldn't have been nearly as open to that conversation. And so I started interviewing and talking to Charlotte Yarconi, who's my boss now. I started talking more to her. I really liked her. I really liked the people I was meeting. Came up to Seattle and Redmond and probably one of the last real trips up there that there was. Um, met more people up there and got to a point where I really was like, this is just such a unique opportunity to combine passions that I have, i.e., you know, startups and the startup ecosystem and you know and, and do it for in a very unique place and again like the idea of going to a company with the power and the 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 you know the resources and the great talent that microsoft has but being in an area where you could create exponential growth for that company i.e the startups ecosystem that's a rare thing and so being able to do that and get that opportunity was so rare that i was like i, I i'm on board and so I came on board, I think it's, you know, the better part of five weeks ago and now have been um, just trying to navigate and figure out what we should be doing. And we, we really have a variety of different programs. We have a variety of different assets. Um, but at the end of the day, like what we really have more than anything is the ecosystem that Microsoft is specifically for, you know, B2B companies or business to enterprise or anyone hoping to sell into the enterprise we can provide a value proposition that our competitors can't. And, you know, the minute that I'm able to talk to an entrepreneur about that value proposition, it's really easy for them to understand, you know, why they should be building on Azure and why they should be embracing our partner ecosystem and our opportunities to do things like sell with our sales team. And so um, let's kind of dig more into that. Um, you run into somebody that you worked with previously in San Francisco, or I don't know if you ran into them, but right now in the current time, but you would actually go and meet up with them. And they said, okay, why Azure, man? Glad you're at Microsoft. Like, you know, why, or even like, why build a startup right now? It's very yeah. interesting. Let's talk a little bit about Azure, why well, that? So yeah. there, there's, a, there's a couple, there's a couple great, great things to unfold there. Okay. Um, one of the conversations that I had when I was trying to figure out whether I wanted to take on this role was with a friend of mine who's an entrepreneur, um, and he um, was CEO of a company that was, you know, top tier VC back. They're already at like a hundred fifty million dollar valuation, um, and you know, I wanted to vet out how challenging this would be to get people from that sort of world to move over to Azure. And what he said to me at that moment. I, I think in many ways changed my life. And he said, you know, I have become a tremendous Microsoft fanboy since I started this company. Um, you know, the day that I started meeting with CIOs and C C CISOs, chief security officers, I've realized how important Microsoft is and how important and, and what they think about Microsoft. And he said, I took 37% of my net worth at that moment and put it into Microsoft stock. Because I realized how important. What year was this? What, when was this? This is when? probably a year and a half, two years ago that he did this. When he started this company and he started talking to CISOs and CIOs. He did and, well. And 
but the conversation that he and I had about this was, you know, um, well, maybe three months ago or four months ago when I was, was contemplating this, this opportunity. And so we went on to talk about it and he said, you know what, like every customer that we want to sell into is on Microsoft. They're on Azure, they're on Microsoft products. And, you know, the, the, uh, the, the thing that he did not realize when he started the company was how important Microsoft would be to him. You know, he wasn't thinking when he picked, and he picked AWS over Azure to start with. And, and I think in a lot of ways, it wasn't even a consideration for him to, to do Azure because he was just doing what default is in Silicon Valley, which is AWS and GitHub. And, you know, you probably go on Slack or what, you know, you just, that's just what, and you use G Suite and whatever. And I, I would like to change that conversation because one, we all need competition. Like if you have incumbents that largely are, you know, not, um, you know, that are not innovating or not being pressed from a competition standpoint, then they're not innovating. And so that's important to one push. So we need to push and offer real opportunity and choice for startups. Um, the second thing that we really need to do is is to make them understand that if you're going to eventually sell in the enterprise, which most business to business companies will want to do at some point if they want to become big, there is no reason not to be on Azure because you know we have things like CoSell where we literally will allow companies that are our partners, startups that are our companies, sell with our sales team or have our sales team sell for them. We will have go to market strategies that we formulate with you so that you can go to market with Microsoft so that you can actually close a deal on Microsoft paper so that those big companies that are scared to do work with a startup, they know that you have the Microsoft seal of approval. That means so much. And honestly, no startup entrepreneur is thinking about that in the early days. It's just it's just not something that they think about. And so, um, you know, it is it is definitely there's huge opportunity um, for, you know, startups and huge value proposition that we give to them. And this isn't even touching on the way that Azure itself as a product has gotten to be, you know, a best in class in many different ways. That's awesome. Hey, we're, we're, we're running in on time here. And I just kind of one last thing, you know, one of the things about Microsoft, I've been back for a few years has been culture. And I think, you know, you always say culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think I'm so thankful, especially right now that the company has done so much work around that. One of the things you hear is, hey, you know, use Microsoft as a platform for areas you have passion, areas that, you know, you want right. to use in the world. And so as we close out, just kind of, uh, you know, really tell me like kind of an area that you have some passion for that you're going to start bringing into your work around and leading your team around startups. Let's, let me hear about that. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things lessons and, and you'll resonate with this that I learned at Twitter was that the most important part of working for a big company is that you need to feel like you have a purpose. You know, it's the classic Maslow's pyramid of needs, um, you know, purpose and, 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 you know, like being part of something important and mission are very important. And at, at Twitter, a lot of times we believe that that mission of democratizing free speech and of being the platform for conversation, serving the public conversation, that, that, you know, mission that Jack had was was sort of more important, and that drove us through almost any challenge that we had. So as I thought a lot about this opportunity at Microsoft, I was like, I need to really figure out what my purpose is. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to derive the same amount of satisfaction and work as hard as I did while I was at Twitter. And what I realized is that allowing and creating more opportunities for underrepresented, you know, founders, i.e., the, you know, people from minorities or female founders, et cetera, that is a huge, you know, the, the idea that opportunities are, should be, you know, democratized also, there should be, everyone should get the opportunity to start a company. And that's just not true now that you can go through all the different reasons that is. And as I went through Microsoft and started meeting and meeting more people, I realized one of the, like the really stark differences from some of the places I'd been in the Valley is how many women are in meaningful leadership positions here from both a technology standpoint, sales standpoint, and otherwise. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't any like force, you know, quota. It was like real. Like everywhere I turned, I was meeting like an amazing, powerful, strong leader that was a woman. And so one of the first things that I really want to touch on in Microsoft for startups is the idea of the female founder and understanding how we can really embrace and and you know break down some of the barriers and help 
create an ecosystem where the female male founder ratio is much closer to 50 50 than what it is now and it's not even close to it now that's probably the first place that we'll tackle on a programmatic standpoint but all sort of underrepresented minorities and and fit, figuring out how to chip away at all of those so that opportunity does become equal um, in the world of, of startups and how Microsoft, you know, from a standpoint of both reach and resources and, and talent can help us help us achieve that. We have such a responsibility. I mean, you know, what the industry needs to be is not what it is today. And you know, I've seen that too, you know, just uh, at Microsoft and different companies about just the strength of female leaders. I mean, I'll just be really honest. I mean, when I've worked for Jana at Twitter, um, the things that I learned how to go do is just phenomenal. One of the best managers I've ever had. I work for Charlotte as well, too. And I will tell you, um, it just my career has, when I've worked for female leaders, let's just be honest, has gone further than it ever has. And what we need to be able to go do for the community is so essential um, because if you want to build software for the world, it's got to be represented of people around the world. And that diversity and inclusion matters. Um, thank you, Jeff, so much. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in uh, to Build. I really hope you guys appreciate uh, and you know, are enjoying the show, and we really appreciate that you're tuning in today. We hope you're being safe, you're resilient, and you're thinking about building the next th big thing. Go to startups.microsoft.com. Whether you've dreamt about building a startup and you want to get started or you're, wow, I'm tuning in because I know Jeff from some other thing and I'm not really sure what this is. But really, the startups are really born to be innovative. And, and we need that innovation now more than we ever, especially with the pandemic. So have a great show. Startups.microsoft.com. Jeff, anything to say as we close out? No, I mean, I think you touched on one of the things that I didn't really answer was around why this is such an important time. And yeah, I mean, there's there's going to be a huge move to the digital world. There's going to be huge problems that need to be solved, and we need the smartest people um, being able to try to solve those problems. So there's there's no better chance time right now than to roll up your sleeves and itch, you know, scratch that itch to start a company. We're hungry for the business. We want to help. We're here. Uh, let's get started. Jeff, thanks to Mike. Thank you for coming to Microsoft. We really appreciate it. Love working with you already, man. And thanks, everybody. Um, have a great build. Thanks. Thank you.